apologies for the slight delay in getting this live. It's unfortunate the way technology works sometimes. First of all, I will say that YouTube, since their refresh, they've got some bugs they need to work out. One of the most important ones that's really irritating is when you upload a video to YouTube and you want to do a custom thumbnail, for whatever reason lately, the custom thumbnail for me hasn't been working. I'll upload a thumbnail, hit save, like everything looks good, and then it'll reset and like it's gone. Apparently, if you like slightly tweak the text or the description, sometimes that can fix it. I've had some success with that, but other times it hasn't worked at all. I've had to just refresh the browser and it's just like over and over, just trying to upload a thumbnail to a YouTube video. Really irritating. I don't know why this is a bug, but it exists. So if you're having that problem, you're trying to make a YouTube video and give it a custom thumbnail, as almost everyone does, just tweak some of the text to see if that like kind of wakes it up to hold the save. Other than that, as far as live streaming goes, for whatever reason, when I started this setup, it's the same setup I've been using, nothing has changed. YouTube thought there were two streams happening simultaneously and they were one was enabled for like auto start on a different stream. So when I started streaming from OBS, it like kicked that one off and it didn't go live on the one I wanted it to go live on. I don't know why it has to be so complicated sometimes. I understand this is good for some people, but it's like, you'd think it would just, like how many people want to do this? And who, <laughs> why would I want it to just like auto start somewhere else? Granted, it was just like two duplicates of the same stream key. Anyway, to fix the problem, I had to make a new stream key, set that all up, get that into OBS, and now we're live. Hopefully it looks good, hopefully it sounds good. We're gonna talk about cameras. A lot has been on my mind today. A lot has been on my mind today. I've been looking at as much as I can around the Canon R5, the R6, some of the other cameras that are coming, and really Canon, I just, I don't, I don't even know what to say at this point in regards to the overheating because it has become so polarized and people saying, basically up front, it's a photography camera, get over it, it's not a big deal. So, of course, me being me, I had to go make some funny videos just for the memes, just for the, the goofs. So I made these two little silly little videos. And then I also did a heating test on my GH5. And I know that's not the same as the Canon R5 or the R6, but again, just kind of for the, the experiment of it, could I get it to overheat? Because I've never had the GH5 overheat on me ever. And now that this is such a controversy with the Canon R5 and maybe the R6, maybe not, they overheat in like their main premium modes, but there's other modes that are totally usable. There's a lot of charts online you can look up, but basically the way it breaks down is that the Canon R5, the features they advertised up front that were a huge part of the rumor and hype around the R5, those premium features cause the, cam the camera to overheat. Now, is this a situation where uh, the camera is, is physically warm on the outside? According to some people, no, it's not. This is all internal within the camera. And this is important because other cameras like the A7S Mark III, people are also talking about how that can overheat in certain modes as well. However, there is a distinction. The Canon R5 and the R6 both fall in the category of internal heat created by the unit itself. This is not a situation where the ambient temperature of the room or whether you're outside or inside or there's direct sun or you're in complete shade, it doesn't seem to really matter. All that matters is the camera, the R5 and the R6, they are running, they are functional, and that in itself is causing them to warm up dangerously, apparently according to the software in the camera saying this is getting too hot, we need to stop you from recording. Now, this is it can be exaggerated by additional high temperatures outside from direct sun, but it's not directly associated with that. So just having the camera in a hot place and then being like, oh, we'll take it to a cool place, that'll be fine, that's not the solution. There is no solution because the camera itself is warming it up. In my GH5 test where I took it outside in the Phoenix summer, midday, full sun, I'm intentionally warming the camera up with 
sunlight. So in this video, I'm doing the best I can to make the camera really, really hot because I can't get the can uh, camera to do anything else like on its own. Like I can't um, have the GH5 overheat on its own. It needs the direct sunlight. It needs something external to warm it up because the camera itself and the sensor is not is not doing it on its own. Where the Canon R5 and the R6, they have internal heat temperature that is being produced by the sensor, by the the the, the chip in, in the camera. Why is this such a big issue? Well, because people make excuses for Canon all the time. They like to say that it's just a photography camera don't worry about it, you don't need these features or you don't use them all that often, 8K RAW, you're only gonna use clips, 4K 120, you're only gonna do twi clips. This is specifically on the R5. On the R6, it also will overheat in the 4K 60 mode, which is the fastest frame rate and the highest resolution that that uh, tops out at. And other people have experienced issues where they're getting overheating, just taking photos and just the cameras running themselves, just being on, they get warm. And that's obviously a worse problem if you live where I do in Phoenix, Arizona, and it gets really hot, just normal baseline. So the problem becomes, how do you cool this thing down when it's not based on the ambient temperature, it's all internal. Like you can't just be in a slightly cooler room and be fine. It is going to warm up. And this is where I'll give other cameras like the GH5 in my test or the a7s3 i'll give them a pass if you're putting a camera in direct sunlight and you're causing it to overheat due to external factors well a software manufacturer a camera manufacturer they can't plan for exactly what scenario you're going to put it in if you want to go to mars or you're going to go to the surface of the sun it's not the camera's fault that it's overheating you're putting it through a stress test which is what i did with the gh5 i put it through a stress test now if you're not stressing out the Canon R5 and the R6 and you're just filming, they still overheat. And this is where I think it becomes a kind of, you can't make the excuses that people are making. Are these great cameras? Yeah, I think some of the photography features are incredible. As far as the autofocus goes, it's probably the best that I've ever seen just from demos online. Is the stabilization good? seems to be maybe there's some wobble issue but for the most part it seems to be pretty good stabilization is it impressive that the r5 can record 8k raw yes that is impressive that it can do 4k 120 yes that's impressive all these things are impressive if the camera is functioning and is on stabilization autofocus are of no use to me if i can't actually use the camera 8k raw 4k 120 if the camera can't record it it's like the feature doesn't exist. And I get that people want these cameras for photography and they are hybrids. This is all true and fair. What bothers me is when we look at articles like this from DP Review, the R5 and the R6 overheating claims tested. Cameras work as promised, but that's not enough. So they criticize Canon in this but I'm going to pull something out here that I think is a little, little false, a little phony. This phrase right here. It should be noted that Canon did not design either the R5 or the R6 to be professional video tools, nor does it primarily market them as such. But based on our testing and real world usage, we would caution against using them as a substitute. Canon, like this is this is objectively false. Canon, I don't know if they designed it to be a professional video tool, but they did primarily market them as such. When you look at the early rumors, the releases of what this camera could do, how it's talked about in the promotional materials on the landing pages for the, these products, they are talked about as their video their video features and the, and the functionality there. So to give the pass to Canon of like the excuse, oh, well, they didn't market them that way. Like that's, all, that's not true. They are actively doing it in their press releases and their announcements and their marketing materials. Video is at the forefront and as it should be. This was supposed to be Canon's 
resurrection back oh remember the 5d mark ii remember remember those glory days when when canon kicked off the dslr revolution remember that the r5 was going to blow everything out of the water 8k 4k 120 plus the amazing photography features that are there it was a no-brainer i i said this in another video but i was going to buy the camera i was like yes this is like perfect the canon lenses everything about it like yes i want it but I don't want a tool that is unreliable to the point where I can't use the features that I'm buying the camera for. I have a GH5 that does 4K 60 and it's, I have a GH4 that's done 4K 24 for, what has it been, six years now, something like that? I don't even know. The GH4 has been doing this for a long time. And granted, I know it's micro four third, but let's look at the Lumix S1H. That's a full frame camera that does 4K 60 without overheating without a crop, has stabilization. I know people like to rag on it for the autofocus and it's nowhere near the Canon in terms of autofocus. By no means is the S1H as good at autofocus, but it doesn't overheat and you can use it all the time, however you want, because it doesn't overheat because they put fans in it. The A7S III, apparently, and granted, I, you know, I haven't tested these cameras myself, but apparently all the research I can find is that yes, it will overheat in certain environmental conditions if it's hot outside. I still think that's really frustrating, the fact that it, it does overheat sooner uh, than the Canon does in certain situations, as well as the S1H. I don't know if the A7S III is plagued by the same internal heating though. It doesn't seem to be. It doesn't seem to be what people are talking about. But I think just across the board, this is a huge letdown for such amazingly powerful tools to be so just sidelined by by poor design i don't you know like is it on the end who do you blame right who do you blame if the camera literally can't do what you say it can do then don't say that it can do it keep it the same way the canon's always been keep it your 4k 30 you know oh maybe now you have 4k 60 for the first time oh wow great great canon's finally entering the game at least it works, you know? And now to look at it and say like the R6 is like, okay, well the R6 is, you know, it's a little bit smaller, uh, less resolution on the sensor. So it's got less to, uh, downscale and yeah, you don't get 4K 120, or you don't get 8K, you get 4K 60, but that still overheats too. And people wanna say, oh, you need to buy a cinema camera if you want cameras that don't overheat. This is untrue. If you go and you look at the Lumix S1H, a full frame camera, mirrorless, doesn't overheat, $4,000. Basically the same price point. It exists, it's doable. There's also, if you're curious, there's the Zcam E2 F6 and the Zcam E2 F6 also a full frame camera, 6K, $4,000. Now you might say this isn't a photography camera, it's not a hybrid, fair enough, okay. So is this what you're talking about when you need a professional cinema camera? Like this, the same price point, the same relative, relative size. I know it's a little bit bigger, a little bit different form factor, but same price, roughly the same specs. This will do 6K 60, it'll do 4K 120. 10 bit 422, like it'll do what you're so excited, you know, like that the that the R5 like can do in bursts. And I've seen that, you know, mentioned is like, oh, if they had only said that it can do it in bursts, that would have been better. But would it have been? Like, I, I think we would have all, if that was the rumors, hey, it can do 8K. And people were like, 8K, like for real 8K? And they're like, yeah, 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 it does 8K. And you're like, no crop? And they're like, yeah, no crop. And you say, 8K, continuous recording. It can record 8K. And they go, oh, no, well, it's burst mode. You'd be like, oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. I got you. But it's not even burst mode because burst mode implies that you can do a burst and then you can do another burst and then you can do another burst. We're talking about a camera that has to be powered down for upwards of 30 minutes just to r reset itself to refresh. Now, people have discussed that this might be some over overly ambitious um, feature 
in the software just designed to like make sure that it never ever 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 gets too hot so it's just always cutting it off too soon and that it could go longer and maybe they'll optimize the firmware so that it can let it record longer in which case okay but like how much more are we talking about are we talking about, about the point where like you could record a whole day and you'd never know that's that's the difference i doubt it it's probably more like okay they can shave they'll give a little bit more cushion like 10 more extra minutes 20 extra minutes and i really want to get my hands on it to know okay if i'm just using this throughout the day and i'm starting and stopping just on a regular shoot is this gonna be an issue and it sounds like it probably is even peter mckinnon himself the canon ambassador the one paid to promote the r5 talks about how he had issues with the r5 making the content that he was making for these videos so when you look at all of this and you wonder you say what like i get that you you want to look at the camera and say it's a photography camera and if you want a real video camera go buy a real video camera i think that doesn't hold up in 2020 i think that's an excuse from 2010 when we were looking at cameras like the 5d mark ii and people would complain like, oh, it doesn't have XLR inputs. And it's like, well, it's a photography camera. Of course it doesn't have XLR inputs. If you want XLR inputs, buy a video camera. Fair. Hybrids have come so far in the last 10 years. And frankly, it's disappointing that they haven't come further. The fact that this stuff is still <laughs> plaguing these cameras, having to do workarounds and goofy nonsense for features that people are eager to buy. They want to hand over their money. And would it have mattered if the camera were a little bit bigger? I, I don't think so. I don't think people get that excited over, oh, we shaved off a couple ounces, or oh, it's a little bit thinner, or it's just like a little bit thicker here, or we expanded this, or we slimmed down that. When you look at these cameras over the past 10 years, they all look about the same. There are some cameras that have come out that have been oddly small, like the a7 series i thought when those first came out like the a7s it was just oddly small and it was noticeably small compared to everything else and felt kind of weird but i think aside from that if you're talking about minor differences in millimeters and and grams oh it's 10 grams or i don't actually know how much like 10 grams might be a lot uh not a metric person uh if you're talking about a couple like couple ounces you know like these are not things that people get worked up over and if they had put fans in there or they made it a little bit bigger or given some kind of heat sink or something to keep it from overheating and it added a little bit of weight or it added a little bit of bulk, I, I don't think anyone would have cared. No one would have noticed. The fact that they say this thing overheats and they put it out there on announcement. So it was all the rumors. It was all the speculation. Then and it was, yes, this is true. This is coming. It really does 8K. It really does RAW. It really does 4K 120. All these features are amazing. And then it gets announced and it's like, oh, by the way, watch out for overheating. Well, now all of a sudden everyone is going to laser beam in on that and go, what do you mean it overheats? And now we have to do all these tests in different environments and different people are reporting different things and it's all chaos. And Make a camera that works and does what you say it does to say that we made, we overclocked it. Like, that's a... Like, that's not normal on any like just consumer products. That's like a specialty feature you like pay extra for, or you say like, yeah, give me the the secret one, but you know, locked away in the safe because like that's the special one. I want you know, I need it for you know this crazy thing I'm doing. If the features on the box are immediately gone because the camera overheats, they shouldn't be features on the box, and that's what is most frustrating and maybe why I get heated <laughs> about it. I don't actually care. I don't hate Canon. I don't, you know, like, I think it's disappointing. I think it's tragic because I would have loved to buy the camera and like, hey, the R5, this is awesome. You know, I'd love to fall in love with it. And the problem is it's like, I don't, I can't invest in a tool that is so unreliable. And I wouldn't recommend anyone else to do that either. Now, maybe there's a fix later, but I wouldn't count on it. I don't know that there's much they can do to fix it. It's just like Panasonic and their autofocus. A lot of people say, oh, well, maybe they'll fix it with the firmware update. It's like, at the end of the day, the hardware is the hardware. There's some optimizations they might be able to make. A few extra codecs they might be able to throw in here or there. A few extra minutes they could save you in terms of heating and cooling. But this is probably inherent to the design for, at a hardware level. So don't hold your breath for this to just be like gone in a couple months when they just like figure it out. The S1H, they put fans in it. 
because it got hot. I assume that's why they did it. So I don't know what to say other than there's no excuse. You have to admit it. If you love Canon and you want to buy the R5, that's fine. Just embrace it, admit it. Don't write it off and say it's not a video camera. That's the worst excuse you could you could say. Especially this article saying that they didn't market it that way. It wasn't promoted that way. It absolutely was. And that's why people would want to buy this camera. Some people, not all. Some people who just want to take photos can just take photos. But if you want a hybrid for the amazing video features that this was supposed to be, and it doesn't deliver it, you have to admit that and just say like, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know why they did that. That was really dumb. Because that's all, all I can say is just like, it's really dumb that they wouldn't optimize their camera for this. What would have added? An extra $500 maybe? Like, is that really that big of a deal? I mean, granted for people's, you know, wallets, I guess. But I would rather have a functioning product and say, eh, it's a little bit expensive, but oh my gosh, it does 8K, it does 4K 120, yeah. Or they, they make it a little bit bigger. They change the design. I wonder what the conversation was when they knew that this was how this camera functioned. And they made the conscious choice. Somebody, I don't know who, somebody at Canon chose, or a team, whatever, whoever, whatever group gets together and says, yeah, put it out, ship it. Is that the decision you'd make? If someone told you, hey, our flagship camera that we've advertised these amazing features on overheats consistently, frequently, quickly, it is inoperable afterward for upwards of 30 minutes just to reset, maybe even an hour, two hours maybe to get fully, fully fresh. Would you make that decision? Would you say, yeah, ship it. That sounds great. People will love it. Or would you say, whoa, 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 what do you mean it overheats? Well, can't we do something about that? What do you mean? Like, is this, it just overheats? Why would you accept that? Why would you ship that? Why would you put that out there and say, this is what Canon represents? A camera so full of features, so loaded to the gills, that half the time you can't even use those features. And if you want, you can shoot with like the bare minimum 4K mode and you can get by on that. But you already have that in the R. So what's the point of the R5 in adding all these extra insane video features for burst mode? I just don't accept these excuses. I don't think it's fair to say that it's a photo camera and if you want something that doesn't overheat, go buy a cinema camera. There's plenty of examples of cameras that are equally priced that offer the same features that don't overheat. Is the autofocus incredible? Yeah. Do I wish I had that in a camera? Yeah. Do I wish that the R5 didn't overheat? Yeah. I wish it worked like they said it worked. Popping into the chat. Stream looks and sounds great. One small thing is the frame rate, which is a little choppy, but not too shabby. It's set to 24 right now. Um, I don't know, like, it, should I stream at a higher frame rate? I don't know, I don't know about that. I, don't know. I, I mean, I, guess I could stream at 30, I could stream at 60. I just don't like the way it looks sometimes. But maybe with the, the connection, I could see why 24 would be maybe not ideal. It's not just an 8K camera. Once you move past that, it's not a bad camera. I agree. I, the, the R5 looks incredible across the board. The problem is that it doesn't work half the time because it overheats. Either it's too incredible, in which case they should have toned down the features and not be, and they're not, and they shouldn't be lying to you. Or on the flip side, they should have just fixed the problem that they knew they had. This wasn't something where it came out and everybody had it, and then there was oh my goodness, all these cameras are overheating. We had no idea. No, they told everybody. They said, yeah, these, they overheat. And people were like, what? Wait a minute. Intentionally, you did that on purpose? Like you put it out there knowing that it's faulty. You're okay with that? It's just a very strange decision. And it leaves the market wide open for Sony. Keep stealing, stealing their market share. But people are determined to say it's 8K. I mean, that's the I mean that's the main, the biggest wow factor. 
I mean, the, the megapixel wars are true to some extent of like you put a bigger number on the box and people are gonna go, oh really? Oh really? You know, I mean, that's like the, the Ursa Mini 12K is in the name of the camera and it's like what everyone talked about it, like the Ursa Mini 12K. It does matter to some people, especially when that's what you're using to market the camera and that's what you tell everybody. You only have like a couple things you can say about it right off the bat before people kind of go like glaze over and they're like, okay, I'll just go read this, the spec sheet, you know? It's like, okay, why am I buying this camera? Autofocus? Okay, great. And then is it the resolution for photography? I, don't, do, I mean, 45 megapixels, are people, you know, on the fence one way or the other, are they like, oh, I've got 36, I really need 45? Like maybe, I, I guess. I just, I don't hear a lot of people talking that way of like, I need 45 megapixels compared to my 28 or whatever they currently have. So it's like autofocus, which also is kind of like the, like it is the tracking, right? You can track animals, track humans with the autofocus. Okay, great. And shoot, what else we have? Mm, stabilization. Yeah, it's really good stabilization. Okay, okay, what else? 8K. Oh, well, there you go. Now it's an 8K camera. Like, I, <laughs> your, your order is like, 8K comes up pretty quick in terms of like, being at the top of the list. They left out the fan to protect the Cineline. It has nothing to do with size. RF lenses are massive. Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, people like to talk, though, about the size of these cameras and the dimensions and is it the same shape. And I get that that matters for, like, cages and, like, if you're, like, your backpack and stuff and where you're putting it. But in general, they could change the form factor slightly. And, like, it's such a meaning meaningless difference I think in in practicality of like oh it's slightly bigger or oh, it's slightly smaller like okay whatever um, leaving out the fans to protect the cinema line I don't know that I buy that I feel like I think they just kind of botched it I th to me if you were gonna protect the cinema line I don't even think you'd say 8k I don't think you'd say it shoots raw I don't think you would intentionally cripple it by overheating you'd put like record limits or you wouldn't put um certain like frame rate options in there of like you wouldn't do 120 maybe you know keep it only 4k 60 because it does oh it does 8k you know 24 and 30 and then it does 4k 60 you know why like why go 120 if you want to protect the cinema line and then why would you protect your 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 brand your high-end brand by making your lower mid-tier brand because it's not low i mean it's just it's just you know flagship for uh photography i mean there are higher end models for photography but in general it's they're like premiere like this is the one right why would you make it so like people are talking about that it overheats taking photos too this isn't just an exclusively video thing i have to see more tests i have to see what more people are saying because it's hard to tell that some people who have access to it are you know really friendly with canon other people who have it are maybe a little bit more honest and transparent but there's not a lot of these out in the wild. Um, there are some. And so the fact that it's affecting photography too, I mean, I would, I would imagine everyone would be outraged over this, not just the video people like myself. I wouldn't be surprised to see an R5 with a fan show up at 2000 more. I mean, $2,000 for a fan, that's like, what was it? Apple did their $1,000 for their stand. I mean, $2,000 is an insane price to pay just to put a fan to, keep, to get the features that you paid for in the first place. I'm sure people will buy it though. And badges the R5C, probably. I agree, they're protecting their cinema line. Thanks, Steve. I'm starting to see Canon fanboys wince about it now. Canon has a legitimate problem. Yeah, I mean, the thing is you can love Canon, you can love the camera, just admit that like what it is is broken. And I don't actually, I don't think it was intentional. I don't think they did it to protect their higher end cinema cameras, I think they just messed up. Maybe they thought people wouldn't care that much. Maybe it was too late and they were like too far through development and they're like, we have this major problem that we cannot fix. And they're just like sunk cost. They're like, okay, well, we'll ship it, I guess. But it just seems so weird to me. It's like such a, it's such a glaring issue that knowing, knowing it about your product, you would think that there'd be everybody in there saying, we have to fix this, we have to fix this, we have to fix this. And then to say, no, this is how we're releasing it. Heads up, everybody, it overheats. 
seems like a really strange choice. Ken always plays both sides, trying to retain people who would go to other brands for more features and restricting those features to higher, higher end bodies. Yeah, I think Ken is looking at it and just, they've lost a lot to Sony. You know, they you have you have your diehard people who are always going to shoot Nikon, or they're always going to shoot Canon, or they're always gonna, they're going to shoot their camera of choice because they've just been doing it so long and they're comfortable with it. You have a lot of people though entering the market rapidly each and every year, picking up new cameras, and there Sony has just been killing it. And we're going to get into that. Sony is doing a great job in the mirrorless hybrid game, making pretty compelling photography cameras and video cameras all in one. The new A7S III is, by most accounts, really impressive. Sure, it doesn't do 8K like the Canon R5, but it does do 4K 120, and it's exceptionally good in low light with good autofocus and maybe okay so-so stabilization but maybe it's all right you know all around the a7s3 looks really really nice but it may suffer from a similar overheating issue like the canon r5 and r6 oh no well thankfully it's not that dire the r5 and r6 are in an entirely different category in terms of overheating they kind of they really messed that one up. I think Sony is in a little different category where people are testing the A7S III and they're saying it overheats, it overheats. It's the same problem as the R5 and R6. It overheats, it overheats, it overheats. However, most people, a lot of people, aren't able to replicate this problem even in you know warm environments. I think Potato Jet put a camera in an oven at some point. I didn't see the video myself, but this is what I heard to cook it to death, I guess to see if it would uh, get too hot and, and shut off. However, the camera overheats when it's exposed outdoor to direct sunlight. So this happened with the GH5. I tested this in my own backyard. I did a video, it's on the channel. You can check it out if you want. Direct sun is gonna warm the camera up beyond its normal operating uh, limit. Now, does the A7S III overheat faster than other cameras like the S1H that has a fan or like the GH5 that has a smaller sensor? Yes, it does. But this is a very controlled, I'll say controlled, situation where you could provide shade, something to help cool down the camera so it's not in that like direct sun warming up. I mean, you figure you put black plastic in the sun, it's going to get really hot. And same is true of the A7S III and it just warms up too much. So different from the R5 in that the R5 and R6 are kind of producing their own heat internally just from the processor warming the thing up. It doesn't really matter if you're in a cold room or a warm room, it just overheats. The A7S III, you can use by all accounts in normal operating conditions. It's just, hey, don't put it in direct sunlight for too long if it's a hot day in Phoenix where I am. And I wouldn't recommend that for any camera. It's just probably not good for any electronics to get too hot. Even your phone will probably overheat on a summer day in Phoenix if it's exposed to the sun because it's just going to suck up that radiant uh, energy. So do I give them a pass? Yes. Is it unfortunate that it overheats in certain situations that you might be outside taking pictures, doing video, and you're, you have to kind of be in the sun? Yes. Do I prefer something a little bit more bulletproof? Yes. However, do I think it's workable and work and you can work around it in a much easier way than what Canon is doing? Yes. The A7S III, if you're on the fence between, I, I put a poll on my channel asking, you know, what full frame camera, if you had $4,000, what full frame camera would you buy? Would it be the R5? Would it be the A7S III? Would it be the S1H? Would it be something else? I think just between Canon and Sony, Go for the Sony if you're looking to spend basically four thousand dollars. I know the, the Sony's a little cheaper; I think it's thirty-five hundred. But if you run that, they're all kind of relatively the same price point. And if you're looking to make an investment around that much, I'd say go for the A7S III compared to the R5. It doesn't have 8K, but I don't think that's the end of the world. I don't think people were clamoring for 8K anyway. Of like, it has to have 8K. I think 4K 120 is far more usable. And the fact that these are resolutions without any cropping is fantastic. And is the autofocus as good as the Canon? 
I don't know. I've seen some pretty impressive results from previous models of you know Sony cameras in terms of eye tracking and whatnot, and it seems to do a good job, better than Panasonic by far. Um, same with Canon. So I think you're relatively safe if you want to pre-order the Sony. Now, would I pre-order the Sony? No, I wouldn't. I don't think you necessarily need to pre-order it unless you have to have it kind of day one. But really, I do recommend probably just rent it, try it out, see how it works for you, see if it's something you, you need. If it does overheat, then hey, you're not out the cost of a camera, you just rent it and you found out for yourself. In your environment, it does tend to overheat for whatever reason. So just keep that in mind, rental's always an option. But I do have to give Sony a, a hand. They're doing an incredible job doing kind of just like the bare minimum. I know that sounds demeaning and I don't mean it to, but Canon is swinging for the fences. They're trying to hit home runs and the bat keeps overheating, right? They're just, it doesn't matter how hard you're swinging. You can 8K, you can draw, you can do all this stuff, but if you can't actually hit the ball, it doesn't matter. Sony has been coasting for years now doing what I would say is kind of the bare minimum. Now, the low light is impressive with the A7S line. That is impressive. But they have the A7S, the A7, and the A7R. They have a different flavor for different people and what they need. And none of these cameras, while they are good, none of them really, in my mind, stand out where having that, like, that one killer feature, that one killer thing that you need. Where, whereas in like the S1H from Lumix, Panasonic, they have the anamorphic features. They have stuff that's like, oh, this is like a video cinema centric tool that is very unique in, in a marketplace that like really doesn't have a lot of that. Like, yes, you can buy cinema cameras that do anamorphic, but it's very kind of odd to put anamorphic features in a hybrid, you know, photography style camera. That's a little kind of interesting and a little quirky and a little weird, kind of different. Sony's done that with the low light, but other than that, you know, now they have the 4K 120, which is impressive. Um, but historically over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, they've just been doing, making good mirrorless cameras. They've had recording limits. They've had tiny batteries. Um, they've had terrible flip screens. Like all the things I've criticized Sony about for the longest time, like, th like they're, I think they're legitimate criticisms, but they were, it was fine. Like there was no competition. What were you gonna buy instead? Canon was basically not offering what anyone wanted in terms of video features. Nikon, same deal. Panasonic and Olympus were like micro four third was it. There was no full, full frame. So it's like Sony was like the only one. They were just sitting there going like, okay, guys, we'll just keep taking all your money. That's fine, whatever. And they've just slowly gobbled up and gobbled up and gobbled up the market. Now you have a ton of Sony shooters out there who are, they love their cameras. And they laugh at Canon and Nikon and Panasonic for that matter. It's just kind of funny. There's nothing all that special that they're doing. They don't have some crazy secret sauce that like no one else could do. Canon could have literally made the exact same camera. Just don't make it overheat. And they probably sell way more units because it's Canon and people love Canon. But of course they have to introduce this like overheating issue. And then people want to say, oh, but the, the A7S III, that also overheats. It also overheats too. Go, oh, but like these are, it's a very different circumstance. The reason it's overheating is separate, it's different. I made the GH5 overheat as well by putting it in direct sun and it probably got over 150 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, probably almost 160 when you take in the fact that it was warming itself up by just operating and running. So why don't more companies actually compete with Sony? Panasonic's starting, they're trying with the S1H and some full frame stuff. Leica, I mean, it's so expensive unnecessarily that I don't even know that it's really even part of the equation. Who does who does Sony have to fight? There's like nobody. Nobody even wants to, it's not even like they're even trying. I don't like I don't know what they're doing. Everyone is asleep. And Sony just gets to get a pass. Even though for the longest time they've had what I've considered like somewhat like they're okay hybrids they're good definitely more on lean more to the photo side than the video side but they've done good video right the low light is good it's great but i wish it had a good flip screen oh wait now they do i wish i had higher frame rates oh wait now they do i wish i had a better battery now it does i wish there weren't record limits now it does like they've they've just caught up and done all like the the little stuff 
And now people are looking at it like, this is like the perfect camera. Like it does everything I want it to do. Why would I get anything else? And they've got their Sony lenses because they've gotten into the system when it was a little bit quirky, a little bit funky. And no one else even bothers company-wise, like other manufacturers. They don't even bother. They're just like, oh, Sony keeps winning. How do they keep winning? They're so brilliant. It's like, they're not though. They're like, there's nothing. Like they're fine. They're good cameras, but this is not, in 2020, we, we, this is, we, it's been a long road getting here. And we should have all seen this coming, right? Resolution is going to keep going up. Frame rates are going to keep increasing. Stabilization has to keep getting better. Low light has to keep getting better. Autofocus has to keep getting better. Like, it is the natural progression of these things. And until someone throws in some crazy, crazy feature, you know, anamorphic maybe, but that's like such a small audience that's even suited for that. It's cool. I'm really glad it's there, but... It's not a, a mass mass appeal kind of feature. Like, hey, it does anamorphic. And people are like, what? Oh, okay. It's like, we've, it's been a long time coming to get here. And it's funny that we're not even at a point where cameras just like do what you would want them to do in terms of like 4K60 on the R6 and it doesn't overheat. Oh wait, no, you can't have that. It does overheat. So I'd say Sony, bravo Sony. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. I guess push yourself because apparently no one else wants to compete with you. I'm gonna pop back over into the chat. Let's see, where did we leave off? Canon, always plays both sides. Yes, we did that. But we watched Sony do this for how many years? How many Sony were plagued by overheating? Maybe I'm just jaded. I've shot with the Sony cameras, not a lot, um, but some. I never ran into an overheating issue. Um, I think I was on a shoot one time where someone was using a Sony and he was like, oh, my camera overheated. And I was like, haha, I have a GH5, it never overheats. Like I probably like made some dumb joke and rubbed it in his face. But um, no, I, was, I probably didn't. Uh, but yeah, like you, that's why I use the cameras, rent them, know how they work in your environment and how you use them and figure out if it's the right tool for you. If you can deal with the overheating on the R5 and the R6, like go for it. Like, It's not like you're a bad person for buying a Canon. I just think it's silly that they made the cameras that way. That's really it. I guess I'm just confused, disappointed. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Canon did this with Nikon back in the day too. Uh, see, before the 5D Mark II, I don't really know much of like the DSLR um, photography cameras before the 5D Mark II. I've always been video centric my entire career. Like I know more about video cameras before the 5D Mark II. Like we talked about them other times, the XL1, the XL1S, the DVX100, the HVX200, um, the kind that kind of camcorder, like where it shifted where these camcorders start having having and like they weren't like your broadcast ENG shoulder cameras they were more camcorder style but they were definitely broadcast in nature but then people were using them for cinema with things like the Letus and Red Rock adapters they had a ground glass inside that would you basically put a, an SLR lens on there and it project an image and you'd record that if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's really interesting to look up. But yeah, basically back in the day on the HVX 200, there was the whole attachment you'd put on the front of the camcorder that was this big box that had to have its own power that would spin glass inside of it. And uh, you'd, you'd capture an image from a photography lens and then you'd rec you, that would be on the glass. And then the camcorder would film that glass um, just to get like super 35. Or actually, I mean, I don't know if that was technically full frame field of view. I don't actually know off the top of my head, but shallow depth of field was the reason to do it. And then the 5D Mark II changed all that. It was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to have this giant big behemoth camera. I still have all that stuff. It could be interesting to take it out one day. But yeah, it's a much better time. This is, I mean, this is maybe that's why I'm so personally connected to hybrid mirrorless, you know, type cameras is like the convenience of having all this power right in your hand. The same way that photographers like when you're a video person and you look at what photographers bring on shoots and you're like oh that's it you walked in here with a backpack like 
that's your job, like lucky you, right? So like video, it's like you have to have so much more stuff seemingly and historically, yeah, the cameras were just bigger. Everything was heavier. It was more of a nuisance. And then Canon with the 5D Mark II was like, oh wait, you can have both in one camera body and it does everything you want. And you're like, what? Okay, this changes things, not just from shallow depth of field, but from actual ability to shoot. You hear people talk all the time about like, you can shoot stuff that people don't even know you're shooting video. And not that that's like a good thing because you can be sneaky, but you can literally put yourself in places where like bigger cameras would not fit. Or you can work longer because the camera is much lighter and you can go a whole day holding it instead of getting exhausted and by the end of the day you have muscle fatigue and you're shaking because you've been holding this giant 50 pound camera all day. Like it changes the way you work. And so when people say, oh, hybrids, that's just for photos, I say you're nuts. Like it's so meaningful and so powerful to be able to shoot video on a hybrid, especially a camera like the GH5 where it just does so much of what you would want to do and makes it easy. Battery lasts a long time. The screen flips the right way and they were doing that way back. Like the GH cameras have been doing that since the very beginning. I have a GH1, you know, flipped as a flip screen. It's awesome. Um, so it's just, it's just funny the way people talk about these things and they say like, oh, well, that's just for the photo people. I'm like, no, I want, I want that camera to shoot video the way they say it does because I can directly benefit from it and I can do my job better. That's why I want it. Not just because I'm like some crazy, I'd like, not, it's not like, people think it's a, ch a cost thing. Oh, well, if you want those features, buy a, a red. And it's like, well, no, 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 I don't, I don't want a red. Not because it's expensive, but because like, I, I don't want to shoot that way all the time. I want to be able to have a camera all in one that does everything I want. And like, we know this is possible because other cameras do it. So you just want the same thing from, from Canon, but can't have it. So back in the chat, the A7S III recovery time is much, much shorter. Good to know. Guessing Canon might have been so obsessed with being the world's first 8K and mirrorless that maybe that's why they justified overlooked the issues so they could snag that title of being first. Yeah, maybe. It's really short-sighted. And it's just a shame to be like, oh, we're the first 8K mirrorless camera. And 8K, oh, that's a photography feature? No, no, that's for video. Oh, so it shoots video. No, it's not a video camera. Don't get confused. Thing overheats. Can't call it a video camera, apparently. And they could be thinking, ah, we'll fix the overheating in the R5 II or in the R4 or whatever. Is being first worth the outrage they are getting? Likely not. Sony is taking more of the Apple approach, not always being first to release flagship features, but waits releases a much more refined product overall. I think Sony does the, they make very smart decisions. I think they look at where things are going and that's probably why things, the why we didn't get the A7S III sooner. They probably were just waiting for something like the R5 to be announced and then they were like, yeah, and here's our thing too. Like the A7S III, I don't know when it was done, but I, they have to have been working on that camera for, they already have, what is it, an A7 IV? You know, they've had like the A7 III, uh, they've had the A7R III, the A7 IV, and they never even had an A7S III. They've been, it's been the A7S II for the longest time. And so I think they've just been sitting on it and they're like waiting for somebody to stand up and Canon stands up and they say we do 8K and they get immediately hammered back down by their own doing because they decided to make a toaster instead of a camera. Back in the chat, the Canon and Nikon at least have better mounts than the APS-C Sony mount. The APS-C Sony mount, are you talking about the E-mount? As far as I'm aware, that's a full frame mount. So I don't know what you're talking about there, Steve. Sony too have to protect their cinema line. Yes, but they, they seem to be doing it less. <laughs> By all accounts, the A7S III, even though it has many similarities to the A7S II, is basically an entirely new camera. Seems Sony really reevaluated what putting out bodies every six months was doing. Probably, but probably not. They'll probably keep doing that with some of their uh, lesser cameras. They love having like Gen 4, 5, 6. I think the, was it, the RX100 is on 6 or 7. 
like they just keep cranking out ver like it's the you know the the cell phone smartphone model just keep making more of the same thing i do appreciate that the a7s3 is significantly different from the a7s2 um the flip screen alone was like is like that's such a big feature for me of just having a screen that works all directions that you would want it to work in back in the chat i think sony has learned the hard way maturity in the mirrorless they just started doing it before everybody else full frame mirrorless they were the only ones i can't say they were like the only but i'm pretty sure they were only because like they've been mirrorless for the longest for full frame out of canon nikon sony and panasonic at least they saw the future as mirrorless and people for the longest time, Canon and Nikon, oh, you need you need a mirror box, you need a mirror box. Oh, no, 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 mirrorless, whoa. The EF mount's not going away, no, no, no. The, the mirror, you need the mirror. Sony was like, no, you don't. And people are like, the technology, the, the, I have to look at a TV, I have to look at a little screen in my viewfinder, that's not the same thing. And they're like, yeah, well, we'll get there one day, like the technology will get better, so like it'll catch up, it'll be fine. And now, like, no one even seems to care. Now that everyone's, everyone's gone mirrorless, it's like, oh, yay, the future is here. And I'm sure all the Sony people are like, yeah, we've been here. Welcome. Welcome to the party. So Sony has the advantage of they've been doing it longer. So they have the technology. They've embraced video, not to the same extent that Panasonic has, but they've embraced it significantly, uh, especially with the A7S and just going for low light and making a hybrid camera with a low megapixel count. You know, that's kind of kind of actually really interesting compared to everybody else who's intentionally limiting their megapixels for the sake of having good clean video it's not canon they're not doing that so i guess panasonic with the gh5s theoretically but that's what was like a reaction to what sony was doing because sony was just dominant oh we we can shoot in the dark i don't think it's like I've talked about this before. It's not the end all be all feature of like, you don't need lights. Lights are important, but it is a nice feature to have. So they, they got into it early. They saw the future. They've been building a lens system around a mount that does what people want it to do. And they're just delivering it. They're saying, yes, here's, this is what you want. Here you go. Would you like to buy it? And people go, yeah, I want to buy it because that's what I want. It, it, again, it's not rocket science. They're not doing anything super special or super secret or like oh why, why, why do people keep buying sony's they're just making good cameras i don't know if everybody made good cameras they'd probably all sell a little bit of all of them and we'd argue over like the minutia of it not like oh the camera overheats <laughs> like it would be like oh well we would talk about more like the codex right and we would get down to stuff about like well those files don't edit as nicely and as efficiently you know like oh they're a little slower to edit those files so i like these ones because i can just shoot right off the card and, oh, okay great 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 you know we could talk about workflow and optimizing stuff but right now we're talking about cameras not even working as intended back in the chat uh, the E-mount came from APS-C. The full-frame sensor barely fits. I'm referring to the Z-mount and RF mounts. They can simply make wider, faster glass. That is an interesting point. So, I, yes, the E-mount was initially designed for APS-C. Um, as far as how that affects the lenses, I don't know, but I'll take your word for it that, yes, I'm sure um, the size of the mount matters. That's why I kind of like what the direction Panasonic is going and finally adopting full frame with the L mount um, and Sigma makes some great lenses and they've also got an L mount camera the FP which I don't know enough about um, I think it's kind of like cool and kind of interesting that Sigma made a camera but aside from that I don't think it uh, catches my eye really as far as like I want it or you know like it's got something that I don't already have or Maybe I'll wait for like a Gen 2 or 3 or just see where it goes. But I think it's interesting that they're doing it. So I like uh, the fact that like we have more proper full-frame mirrorless options to choose from. I'm guessing Sony will release a new mount in the next couple of years, at least just to sell new lenses. They very well might. And I'm sure people would be really upset. And that is the problem with these systems is that once you buy into the system, you feel like you're kind of stuck. 
I think that's why micro four thirds has stuck around for so long is because there's so many people with these lenses of like, oh, micro four thirds, this is like the perfect, like whatever it was like, you know, theorized as like the perfect combination of like size and performance and portability and all price. But like, it doesn't really matter because it's still a big bulky camera with a big old lens on it. It's smaller lens, it's, it's, it does way less. They are cheaper in some situations, but other times they're not not significantly so. So, like, but Micro Four Thirds still around because people people bought it, it, like, and you can't just like get rid of it and make a lot of people mad. But that's what happened to Four Thirds, because like Micro Four Thirds came after Four Thirds, and I don't know enough about Four Thirds, but I've definitely had some fans. Back in the chat. Sony are a generation five of mirrorless. They've made a fair share of mistakes leading up to the A7S III. The funny thing is people were laughing a bit at the A7S III being 4K until the R5 overheating. I didn't see a lot of people mocking the, the A7S III for being just 4K. I think I saw probably a lot more people mocking the R5 for even going to 8K, like people saying like scratching their heads like why? Definitely get the benefit of 6K. As like a, if you're finalizing in 4K, now you have 6K, so you can kind of downsample. And 8K, I guess theoretically makes sense to some people. It's not like what I would personally like want or need. It would be cool, yeah, but like it's not the feature that I'm like dying to have. Uh, more more so 4K 120 for me personally uh, would be a valuable thing to have. And then you know 1080 at like 240 or 300 like higher end uh, frame rate stuff for 1080 would be fantastic back in the chat. Canon is also helping Sony look really, really smart. Yes, they are. So last thing I want to talk about tonight is the S1H and just Panasonic in general. What in the world is Lumix? If you walked up to a random person on the street, would they even know what a Lumix is? Most people when I have a GH5 will ask me what that camera is and I'll tell them it's a Lumix GH5 and they'll go, uh-huh, I never heard of that one. Because these people aren't usually professionals, they're usually not people who are familiar with cameras and gear like we all are. But they're people who are curious about what good cameras are. Like, oh, what do you shoot with? Because, you know, I'm gonna, I wanna get into photography. You know, those kinds of people were like, I wanna do what you do, what camera is that? Is it a good one? What's the best one? <laughs> which is a whole can of worms you don't want to open. But when you say Lumix, people have no idea what you're talking about. Now, if you say Nikon or Canon or Sony, these are all brands that people are very familiar with. Legacy brands that have been around for decades. Sony in the camera space, maybe not so much, but it's definitely a brand that people are, it's on their TVs, it's on their game console. People know what Sony is. It's the Walkman, the Sony Walkman. What is a Lumix? Is Lumix mean anything? Well, we all know it's Panasonic. In fact, Panasonic will tell you about Lumix on the Panasonic website. If you search Lumix, that's what comes up, the Panasonic website. You can go to B&H or you can go shop Panasonic. Panasonic, Panasonic. People talking about the Panasonic Lumix. Oh, Lumix is Panasonic's brand of digital cameras. I talked about this in another video, but it's pretty silly to have the name Lumix because it doesn't mean anything to anybody. I don't think any regular consumer even knows that Lumix and Panasonic are the same thing. But I bet most people, if you said Panasonic, they know what that is because Panasonic, they make cameras, they make TVs, they make electronics. Panasonic, I know that brand. Lumix, I don't know what that brand is. In fact, most people who talk about cameras, like I say GH5 all the time. I don't say Lumix GH5. I don't think anybody does because the GH5 is a GH5. If anything, I'll say the Panasonic GH5 and Panasonic and Panasonic and Panasonic and Panasonic because that's the company doing it. This arbitrary designation of Lumix means very, very little. So they should get rid of it. It's pointless. There's no reason to have it. Call it a Panasonic GH6. Call it a Panasonic S2H. 
call it. Why have a sub brand that's meaningless? It's like Nikon Coolpix. If it was just like, oh, no, it's a Nikon. But it's a Coolpix. Who cares? It's a Nikon. I don't know anyone else that's really championing this. Canon, I guess they have the Rebel line of cameras. Maybe that's close. But typically those all have a number too, like a T3R and you're just like, it's a Canon. I think Rebel's maybe in the corner, but it doesn't say Rebel at the top. It says Canon, because that's what it is. It's a Canon. The GH5, it's a Panasonic. Not obviously though on it, it says Lumix. And people don't know what that is. Now, is this the fault of Panasonic and their marketing? Probably. Could they do a better job of getting people to understand what Lumix is? Probably. But that's a really, really long, long road that I don't think the Lumix brand is going to last. Panasonic as a company will last. Maybe, hopefully. But Lumix? Are we going to still be talking about Lumix in 20, 30 years? The same way we're talking about Canon and Nikon for a century? I don't think it's staying that way. It doesn't make sense. I've talked about Canon and the EOS. But no one says EOS. It's not on the camera. It doesn't say EOS up at the top. It says Canon, Nikon, Panasonic, Sony. The company that makes the camera. It matters just for people knowing and like familiarity and like, oh, I heard, you know, Panasonic is good, the good one or Canon's the good one. Just for your regular people who like, and this is why I think the Lumix brand suffers is because it's kind of a bad name and kind of confusing. Everyone who talks about the camera talks about Panasonic. You go in a camera store and you're like, I want the Panasonic. None of them say Panasonic. They all say Lumix. So on the marketing side, I think they've dropped the ball and haven't done a good job getting out there and like explaining what this is. Because even if they did, it doesn't even need to exist. It is so pointless. It's on the Panasonic website. There isn't a Lumix website. As far as I'm aware, we could do a little bit more searching. But I don't think there's a Lumix website. Amazon, CNET, DP Review. No, I don't. Is there a Lumix.com? If you go to Lumix.com, where does it take you? I bet it takes you to Panasonic is where I bet it takes you. Nope, it takes you to this. Lumix, compatible flash tubes by Folkscene? I've never, I don't even know what this is. Broncolor, Photo. So it's lighting stuff? This website is not the Panasonic website for Lumix camera. If you want to go to the Panasonic website, click here. Let's click on over, shall we? Oh, we're being redirected to Panasonic website. Point proven. Lumix is silly. Apparently it's light bulbs. If you want a Panasonic camera, Put it, put it on there. I know you, I know someone's really tied to Lumix. I think it's the greatest thing ever. I'm telling you, people don't know what it is. They don't care. We all call it Panasonic anyway. We've been, everyone has been <laughs> against Lumix since the GH1. Everyone knows it is Panasonic. I don't know why we're all against Lumix because it's pointless and stupid, but I don't know why we're against it. Get rid of it. The website panasonic.com put it on the cameras and i think people will be more familiar they'll like they'll go oh wow cool sony panasonic canon nikon you know fuji like these are the names that have been around a long time in the kind of popular consciousness panasonic is a strong brand lumix has been around for a long time and still nobody knows what it is but if you say I shoot with a Canon or an Nikon, people instantly know, okay, I know what that is. Even Sony now, they've done a great job. Panasonic could do a lot better. Pop back in the chat. I've owned a lot of cameras and the S1H is the camera that overall I've been happiest with. It's just rock solid. It's not flashy, not particularly pretty, pretty bricky, but it's a workhorse. That's what I'm most excited about the S1H4 is I love that Panasonic, should I call it Lumix? I don't know, I don't know what's fair. 
I think I'm gonna call it Panasonic because that's what it is. It's Panasonic. It's Panasonic S1H. I like the Panasonic mentality of like giving you features that work and giving you as many features as they can put in it. Seemingly, the only thing that seemingly was kind of a, a slight from their more premium cinema line was the Vlog L compared to Vlog. You know, that discrepancy of Vlog L was kind of this weird squished cutoff version with only 12 stops, but real Vlog was 14 and, and that kind of whole thing. But it seems like they've done a really good job with the GH cameras keeping things pretty, pretty on point with like giving you the right codecs that you would want, the resolutions, the frame rates. And the same thing with the S1H, a camera that just works, but now it's full frame. And I, for the longest time, even from the GH4, you know, for the GH5, I was talking about like, let's get a bigger sensor, let's upgrade, let's go, let's move forward, let's look like Sony and look like we're headed in the future direction with these cameras. Because I've I've loved the GH camera since the GH1. And I'm happy to shoot with anything, but I'm glad that Panasonic has adopted a full frame mindset uh, for mirrorless maybe it's a little bit too late I don't know I don't think so considering the way the s1h just like the features like it's it's probably the most attractive camera to me at this point in that kind of like full frame hybrid uh, game although the a7s3 does look really really nice so I want to get my hands on both of them test them out, see which one works better. But that's my feeling is that the S1H is just like this workhorse, just the same way the GH5 is. Like the GH5, so I have a GH5 that I shoot with all the time, a few of them. And then the Ursa Mini Pro, the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro. Ursa Mini Pro is a much better camera. Built-in NDs, more dynamic range, shoots ProRes, like everything about the camera is a better camera. It's a more expensive camera. Do I find myself shooting with the GH5 more or the Ursa Mini Pro more? Well tend to prefer shooting with the GH5. It's lighter, easier to hold, maneuver, like take with you anywhere, does great photos for like what they are. And in general, it's just this all around like really good camera that does everything I need in, you know, the palm of my hand. Do we get better features with the Ursa Mini Pro? Yeah, but is it as fun to use like just daily? No, because it's much more of like a tool rather than something that I would say the GH5 is like that tool, but it's also kind of a toy in some ways if it's just fun to use. And that's why I'm excited for an S1H potentially in the future to have that same joy of using the camera just because it's so easy that, but it's full frame. Like I'm excited for it. They should ditch the Lumix name and just go with Panasonic. Absolutely. I've never once referred to my Panasonics as a Lumix, me, me neither. I mean, I, I will occasionally, but not really. It's got a middle name, that's right. And I learned about Lumix before Panasonic because I came to Panasonic from Sony. Interesting, did Lumix really stick with you? When you, when you heard Lumix, were you like, I gotta have a Lumix? I don't know, it just seems, it seems a kind of a silly, cheap name to me. I don't know, nothing about it screams premium professional like the features of the camera deserve a better name like panasonic sounds like a legitimate broadcast company because that's what it is lumix sounds like your consumer toys which i said they are toys are fun to use but like there's some really good features in these cameras i don't think you should discredit them with a kind of cheap sounding name i forgot about it in casual spanish lumi is a lady from the street ah but I already got a Lumix tattoo. Oh no, can't easily change that to Panasonic. The important part is Panasonic seems to listen to the customers and stay on top of updates. That is true. I'm trying to think, maybe someone could educate me because I don't stay on top of every firmware update from every company, but in general, Panasonic does significant firmware updates. Features like 6K, uh, recently now they've uh, implemented the ProRes RAW. Who else was doing something? Was it Fuji doing something recently with their firmware where they were kind of like adding some really nice features or stuff that was really helpful? Um, it seems to be less so the case with Sony and Canon. I don't know why that is. I mean, I have a suspicion of why that is. I think it's just where they're at in the market. I don't know that it's from the generosity or goodwill of any of these companies. I think it's just like 
they want to attract customers so they do what customers want and if they have enough customers or they're doing fine they don't have to work a whole lot to get customers then they don't have to do a whole lot either in terms of firmware but I really appreciate the stuff that's come from Panasonic in terms of maintaining their cameras, keeping them relevant, and not cannibalizing their own market, but offering things like the G9, which I've never shot with, but I know it's kind of like a smaller, a slightly less version than the GH5. So there's the GH5, and then there's a G9, which the naming is the other thing that Panasonic should redo. When they get rid of Lumix, Figure out what generation you're on. This is all camera companies. I've talked about this before, but like give them names, give them a purpose, give them like a year they came out or something so we can keep track of like, why would I ever associate a GH5 and a G9? Those don't seemingly go together any meaningful way. Is one a G5 and the other's a GH5? Okay, now that makes sense. But just to have them be these kind of like weird skew numbers and letters it's really hard to keep track of. And and you're talking about somebody who like pays attention to this stuff. Your regular person, they're gonna go, what's Lumix? What's which one do I get? And you say, well, you know, the GH5 does this, but then the G9 does this, and they're gonna go, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I'll just get the Canon. I heard the Canon's good. That's then we'll go buy a Canon. So I don't know, we'll see excited to test the S1H out. I got to get that one as a rental. And then the A7S III, also on my list. The only thing that like really lets me down, I could deal with the R5 overheating and not really care all that much if the R6 were safe. If the R6, it is a really nice looking camera in terms of features. It, it tops out at 4K60, okay. But everything else, Really, I really, and it's affordable. It's the most affordable of all of them. But that one apparently overheats too. So I don't know. Don't know what they were thinking. It's just a shame that in 2020 we have to talk about cameras overheating because a bad design is really all I can chalk it up to. Poorly designed. Someone said it has to do 8K and it's got to do all this stuff. And then they said, okay, we'll put a processor in there that'll <laughs> turn to lava, apparently. I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. I'm glad that Sony exists. I'm glad they're still doing doing a great job putting out good cameras. The A7S III looks great. The S1H, viable contender, I would say. For, for my purposes, it's almost like, I don't know. Don't know. The other one that's intriguing is that Z-Cam. E2, the Z-Cam E2 F6. It looks really, really interesting because it is a full frame camera and it'll do 6K60 and 4K120. And 10 bit color, full frame, 15 slots dynamic range, raw, EF mount, so not the mirrorless mount, but you they say you have optional M micro four third and PL mount. So I don't know how that works. If you do a micro four third mount, if it's like a crop of the full frame sensor, that'd be a little odd. But this thing looks really cool. Four thousand dollars. You have to do an external monitor and a few other things uh, to make it kind of functional and usable. So it's not the cheapest. It is the most expensive. But I like what they're doing. Looks interesting. Not quite the. Uh, hybrid that uh, the S1H is, but really neat feature set if you've never looked at it. They have a few others. There's an F8 that's 8K and then some other ones, but I really think I've, I've kind of looked at them for price and, and what you would want. I think the E2 F6 is probably the one, but I really like that idea of just like flip screen, everything all in one so that no matter where you take it, you always have the right pieces. I hate the idea of like having to have all these accessories to make the camera work for like how you actually operate it. Yes, will the Z cam technically work right out of the box? Yes, but like you, you need a monitor for it. So then it's another thing to bring. It's another thing to to worry about when and I can't imagine. I don't know what the the photos are like on the uh, the Z cam here. 
probably takes good photos if it's got a full frame sensor, but it's definitely not a photography camera. So maybe I'll test it out someday if I can get my hands on one. But for now, I'll just keep looking forward to, I don't know, maybe something cool and fun on the horizon. Right now, the Canon's really put a bad taste in my mouth of just like, man, I really, I really wanted the R5 and the R6 to be good cameras. I wanted Canon to come back and they just dropped the ball. Oh well, come to expect it at this point, I suppose. Let's see, I'll wrap things up here in the chat. I bet that font size was part of the logic for making a sub-brand Panasonic is a long word to cram on the top of a little mirrorless body. Then call it like a panty or something. No, I don't call it a panty. <laughs> people uh, people do refer to it as like, oh, the panty, the panty, but I, you're probably right. It probably was a marketing thing. Panasonic, that's where it's too long. It fits on our TVs, but not on our cameras. Zcam, talk about a naming strategy issue. Yes, the Zcam E2 F6, awful naming strategy. But you seem to be very interested in Zcam. Are you thinking of moving to it? It's a great system. I am interested in it. I, it's that one thing of like, I want, here's what I do like. I like that it takes the, is it the Sony, what are they called? The um, which batteries are they? The N, are they the PN, the NP, where's the battery, battery, battery? The NPF, the Sony NPF series compatible. Um, oh, they, you don't get a battery with it? Oh, that's lame. But they're really cheap. Um, and they come in all shapes and sizes, so you can get big ones, smaller ones. Uh, I like that camcorder style battery uh, for a video camera. I think it makes sense to be able to slap a big old battery on the back of it um, if you need to but um, I would definitely want to test the Z cam out first see how it works see how it feels let me actually see over on lens rentals if they uh, if they do they do Z cam kind of maybe they do maybe they don't hey here we go uh, so there's, yeah, there's the Zcam E2S6, which is the Super 35 one. The F6 is the full frame one. So we've got that right here. Uh, it's not available right now. Is it because maybe someone else has it? Um, there's the, yeah, it's available. So I would definitely test this out, but then I wonder, how do they rent this to you? You probably need all sort of recommended. Yeah, you're probably going to need a LCD and whatnot to, to make it function the way you want, which would be nice if they had a little kit. But I don't see one. Look, you can get an Atomos Ninja 5, which I imagine is what most people are probably using. Pop that over into the chat. I think Zcam might have the smartest tooling out of all the up and comers. The smartest tooling. Fuji X-T4. Fuji, they do interesting stuff, but it's not interesting to me. Um, maybe I'll look at the X-T4, but they always seem like they're kind of off doing their own thing and maybe that's good, maybe it's bad. Same chassis, same layout. They're swapping out processors and firmware. Oh, I assume that's in regards to the, the Z cam. They're just swapping out processors and firmware. Uh, sure, sure, probably, maybe, I don't know. I feel like I would miss uh, B-RAW too much. It really depends on how easy it is to work with their raw files. Yes, and oftentimes I'm not even necessarily uh, worried about raw all that much because a lot of projects doesn't make sense for the file sizes. Um, for the stuff I do that's um, usually there's a lot of footage involved so depending on what the final delivery is and what the project is raw doesn't always make sense just from file sizes so you have to play around and see how all the codecs work for me 
I don't get why you haven't got a Fuji yesterday. All right, I'll check out the Fuji. All right. NPF batteries, yes, those are the, the not, like, everyone knows the, the, you know, DSLR hybrid mirrorless batteries, but I just don't like that they're always like the one size and they can't ever be bigger. It's like, if you want more battery life, have the ability to put a bigger battery on there, which is really smart. I'm glad they did that with the Z Cam compared to Blackmagic where they were for their pocket cinema camera, they implemented the LPE6 batteries from Canon, which in the pocket cinema camera, you know, they choose through them pretty quick. I will say Z Cam have done an outstanding job with their color science. It's beautiful. Before I bought my S1H, I looked at them for weeks, but in the end, I still need to shoot photos. And that's kind of where I feel like I'm at. I like the look of the Z Cam, but do I want a camera that can just take photos too? Yeah, I do. Otherwise, it would have been my choice if it could do better photos. Uh, the 6K with the Super 35 sensor on the Micro Four Third mount looks very intriguing. That is exactly what I think Panasonic should do for the GH6. Panasonic should do it. Lumix should not do anything because Lumix should just disappear. But the Fuji X-T4 is a perfect multi-purpose camera. I'll check it out. All right. I'll check out the Fuji. And then someone says the X-T4 overheats. <laughs> and then... I didn't know. <laughs> That's bad. Oh, the X-T4 over... So you're telling me to look at a camera that you haven't even used? You, you act like you love it, and you don't even own it. I don't know what to tell you. I it is, it is a luxury. Don't get me wrong. I'll wrap it up this way. It is a luxury. Being able to complain about 4K and 6K and 8K, because not too long ago... Most things were standard def. Most things were HD. 4K and above and beyond, especially with higher frame rates. We live in a, a wonderful time in terms of cameras and technology. So it is a joy to see that all this stuff is possible and affordable. And we're not talking about $100,000 cameras. We're talking about things you can buy from Walmart. You know, that's pretty incredible. So I try not to take it for granted. I try not to be too critical and be, you know, some complainer or all oh, yeah, just always hating on everything. But at the end of the day, I do have to be honest. And if I'm talking about how I, what I actually think of a camera, I do think it's ridiculous to design a camera in such a way that you intentionally know it overheats and then you do not fix it. I think that is ridiculous. And that's why I call it a ridiculous camera. I think that's it. I think that's all I have to say. If I say any more, I'll just be repeating myself. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate all the chat. It gives me interesting things to talk about, as well as just talking about cameras. It's so much fun. So, talk later. <laughs>